Okay, recording. And, and, and Tom Andrew Brooks is on. So um, the uh, I think the first thing would be um, um, first item on the agenda is a vote to approve the minutes, which were sent out by Chuck. And uh, Chuck, I want to thank you for and Linda and Tom, the three of you for side of organizing this uh, virtual meeting, but also getting all the scripts and everything out on a timely basis and so on. So and if I left anybody out, um, thank them as well. But in any event, um, uh, we'll approve the minutes. Uh, we do have a motion to approve the minutes of December 3rd. I, uh, this Chuck guy, I, I uh, move that we approve the minutes. And a second. Come on, George. George, George, you second it, right? I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so anybody opposed to adopting them? No, great, thank you very much. So um, in terms of uh, recent audit committee changes, uh, John Lanaway has um, retired from the audit committee. Um, no pension, of course, because there's no pay, so you don't get a pension, <laughs> but he's retired from the audit committee. and. Um, uh, Robin Fryer, a distinguished background, uh, has joined the audit committee, and uh, Robin is uh, not only a, an outstanding auditor, having been trained um, in uh, at least two countries and uh, with a uh, terrific background, uh, he's a, now a, a full-fledged member of the audit committee. I think this is your first uh, in-person official meeting since it's the first meeting we've had, if I'm not mistaken, Robin. Welcome. It is, Bill, and thank you for that introduction. So I guess 5% of zero pension is zero, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I told you were a good accountant. In terms of the non-audit committee members that are on the phone, um, just uh, wanted to thank all of you for um, doing an outstanding job in terms of you know, helping the town get through this uh, crisis. We're unfortunately probably still in the early stages, but realize that a lot of you um, ranging from the boss, Kevin, all the way down to um, the, the most junior employees in town are really working hard, doing a lot of things and adapting every day. So, you know, on behalf of the audit committee member and also the citizens of the town, thank you very much for what you're doing in that regard. Um, we're going to a review uh, of the approved 2021 20, budget and status of discussions relating to the implications of the coronavirus and the contingency planning discussion. And I think, uh, Linda and Joanne are going to pretty much handle this, and uh, I guess I'm going to turn it first over to Linda and then to Joanne, and um, we'll try to move through this agenda um, appropriately. And um, as you can see, um, our chief financial officer, who, by the way, is doing a terrific job. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much. Um, Linda, how long have you been the chief financial officer? Um, I started the. December 23rd, I believe. Yeah. So um, I guess you're getting what they call a baptism of fire at some point. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll turn it over to you and you can take us through the uh, 2021 development budget summary. Maybe a word or two, if you would, about last night's meeting, where we stand. I think I think New Canaan is a leader, um, maybe not all the towns, but I think uh, the governor has allowed the budget to be uh, um, delayed a month or so, right? But I guess uh, we, our town is out in front and decided to adopt it early, right? Uh, yes, and, and part of the reason is because when that order came, different um, towns were different phases of budget development. Uh, we, our calendar as it exists, has us adopting the budget um, yesterday by the town council and then the mill rate setting next week by the Board of Finance. Um, other communities, for example, where I was in, in Norwalk, uh, they're 30 days behind us, and therefore their budget adoption is, is typically the first two weeks in May. And therefore, when the governor issued his executive order, communities were at different phases of budget development. Uh, we were advanced because by the time the governor issued his executive order, the Board of Finance had already finished all of their deliberations and the budget was in the hands of the town council. Uh, this year, the town council was proactive and had an additional public hearing that they didn't do in previous years. And so that had already taken place. So they had already heard from the public specifically on the capital budget. 
at that particular time. And then by the time the order came out, the town council had already completed their... Are you there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's, an, I'm there's a way of putting your phones on mute, if you could do that, or your, even your video, just by pressing the little button up on the right that says mute. <laughs> In our case, I think it's down to the left. Good to go. Yep, go on, Linda. Okay. So the uh, budget development had already had already uh, progressed. Uh, we were further ahead than everybody. So at that point, uh, the town council um, made a decision to just proceed because they were technically um, they had technically heard from everybody else from everyone which is not the case with some other towns um, and so that was largely a function a function of our budget so let me get back to my budget here okay are you back so, so, just, no? just yeah. a bit yeah. understanding standpoint this is this is something that i'm not um, yeah. familiar with but, but the, the budgets once the budgets approved let's just say that the coronavirus um, while it's you know pretty very serious now let's just say it becomes catastrophic and um, however you define catastrophic and and let's just say for example um, tax revenue is you know only 40 percent of what we what we anticipate I mean, or 50, or pick whatever number, it was something that's catastrophic. What flexibility, if any, does um, town leaders have to uh, mandate or suggest um, that, that spending be curtailed as we get into the last three, four, five months of the cycle? So for example, um, could the, um, police department or fire department or somebody else be told to, to spend less because we just don't have the money? Could the, could the Board of Education be told to spend less? Or, um, because you know, sort of in a corporate environment, that's what you can do. I just don't, I'm just not that familiar with the government environment. So help me understand from a, once it's approved, then we get into spending it. And let's say catastrophically, we just can't afford to do it. What actions, if any, does, does management of the town have? Sure, um, I'll speak to the town side and perhaps Dr. Lutzi and Dr. Keating can speak to the Board of Ed side. Um, on the town side, the first selectmen and the Board of Selectmen, because basically the budget is an appropriation. Uh, it does not mean that that money has to be spent in full. As an example, um, early on, a couple of months ago, uh, the Board of Selectmen um, issued uh, guidance to the town that nobody's to travel um, as a result of the, of the, health, of the health issues. Um, any out-of-state out business travel was, uh, was, was paused. Um, and they can do that for, for any aspect of the budget. Um, and maybe Kevin, you could speak more to this, but um, the appropriation is merely that, is an appropriation. So if, the, if we're looking at projections and we start to anticipating things that um, basically the, the scenario you've described, uh, the first selectman and the board of selectmen can issue that guidance to the department and said we need to slow down spending, uh, we need to not do X, uh, we need to stop travel, we need to um, in, enact hiring freezes. So any of those things can, can happen. So just because the budget is approved does not mean that it has to be spent. Great, thank you. The yeah, before, before we hear, be, before, no, I unvoted. Before we go to Brian and Joanne, uh, Todd Lavieri, as finance chairman, two weeks ago started a process of looking at our budget for the rest of this year and for the first 100 days of next year. And we're going to carefully look at how the economy looks a month from now, two months from now, as we go into July. Um, the governor did issue an order that the Board of Education budget cannot be reduced for the balance of this year. Cannot be, so so, so uh, nothing can be done on, on their side, but you know we could we could slow capital projects. We could, uh, we could, as Linda mentioned, we could, uh, we could curtail staff. Uh, so, uh, and, and we, you know, we plan to look at how things stand on July first and decide whether we want to be, begin some cutbacks beyond what so, we do in the next sixty to ninety days. So, Brian and Joanne, perhaps you could address the board of ed. 
Yeah, glad to. And uh, Joanne has been um, deeply involved with this with CASBO too. Good morning, everyone, first. Um, nice to see you all. The, um, so Kevin's exactly right that uh, what was happening was there was some um, discussion happening up in Hartford with uh, CCM and some others about towns trying to actively bring down school board of ed budgets uh, right at this point in time to try to just sort of preemptively do it. And so the governor came out and said, no, towns can't do that. Um, as you know, we've got a great relationship with Kevin, with Todd and the Board of Finance, uh, you know, with the town. So we've actually, when we went into the close, we began working with our principals to, uh, to identify where those uh, savings may be for them within their program. And Joanne and her team have been looking at a macro level to look at things like um, energy, you know, if we're not powering up the buildings or savings there, uh, other spots that, that savings may be available. Certainly, you know, Todd has uh, requested, and we were already doing it, uh, taking a look and see what savings is there at, with a commitment to, you know, well, of course we turn back anything that we can. Um, we still are paying our staff, uh, you know, that's 82% of the budget as we look at salary and benefits. And, you know, you, you know the ins and outs of our budget um, quite well. So there are some fixed, a lot of fixed costs that are still gonna be in there, but we do anticipate we'd have some savings. Uh, some of it we have to be a little um, careful about putting on the table now because we just don't know what's coming ahead. For instance, uh, we've got some money in substitute teachers because you'd say we're not using substitute teachers now. But if our teachers begin to become ill, um, we'll need to use that funding to loop people in to continue teaching the distance learning classes for those folks. So we're uh, you know, sort of looking at it uh, a couple of different tiers. And, uh, and we're, I know we're putting some of that information together now. And the state is doing it, uh, CASBO is doing it across the state on behalf of the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents and the commissioner's office to try to get us a handle on what we might be talking about uh, percentage wise, just to get, give some context to it for folks. So Brian, um, as it relates to this year, you know, which still has a couple more months left, you know, pretty much don't cut the budget, which I think is very consistent with the message the federal government sending out, you know, keep people employed, do very, very, you know, do everything you can to sort of keep the economy going. Um, but but next year you, um, you still may have the same philosophy, but you have more freedom of action next year. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, so next year, last night the town council um, adopted a budget for the board of ed that all in is about a negative 0.8 percent year over year that's uh, operating and insurance all combined. So we're actually spending, I don't know, about 700,000 or so less next year to run the operation than we are this year, according to the town council budget last night that they approved. So if the, pandem budget if, if the pandemic was to go on, you know, 12 months, you would have more freedom of action in terms of that budget? Unless the I anticipate government they would look at, yeah, I anticipate they may, if that were to happen, uh, some of the executive orders may shift. Um, right now, the governor's put out the executive orders around, like you said, maintaining the staff, the budgets in place, you know, maintaining staff, for, keep the employment, uh, and also to use those resources to help through the pandemic. You know, every one of our staff members is doing something every day. Uh, our teachers yeah. are teaching, our TAs are connecting. You know, I can go down the list, I don't need to, but, um, you know, to keep those resources available to help communities through it. Uh, and so we've been doing that too. But yeah, if this were to go, you know, if we, we go out through the summer and go into next year, uh, I anticipate that context would change. Right. You know, on a, uh, Kevin, on a, on a, uh, one of the things that um, I think the audit committee was going to reinforce again or resuggest again is that um, um, maybe slightly less of an issue if, uh, depending on the severity of the pandemic, in the context of how long it is and how many people, but um, uh, you know the, the town doesn't really have a, a strong process around forecasting cash flows or or budgeting cash flows, and um, you know that that is very important um, in, in a crisis situation. And and I and I realize that uh, there's been a lot of work done around what the mill rate might be. Looking back at you know, prior periods, prior crises. Uh, and that may be an indicator, may not be an indicator of where we are uh, going forward. So we, we would we would encourage the town to um, to really put in a cash forecasting process more robust than you have now and, and a cash budgeting process as well. And to, to underline that, um, actually, the, in my judgment, other than a few individual financial products, the two most significant 
dislocations in the financial marketplace over the last six weeks. Uh, one was the availability of liquidity, which the federal government's dealing with by just pouring liquidity into the system. But the other most significant thing is the dislocation between the municipal bond markets and and what's happening, you know, generally in the economy. And um, if things get severely worse, that could be a big, big, big problem. It could make bonding a, a real difficult issue for us from a number of different standpoints. So understanding the cash flows it, it is going to be very important. Linda, could you address that? Because I think, I think we've done a lot of work sure. on that. Yeah. Andrew, are you on the call? Hi, Linda. Yes, I am. And I, I was going to let you yeah. uh, 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 no, take No, maybe you kind of, uh, I'm kind of share some of the dis – oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I'm happy to let you take this one, and I'm happy to, to add to, to what you're going to say. Okay. So to your, um, to your point, Bill, uh, what we've started to do, Andrew and I, uh, this is what, March? Um, I think we started this in January. Uh, we've actually started on that project of cash flow forecasting. Uh, we've gathered, um, looked at all of our accounts where, where, where we have liquid funds, um, started trending on a monthly basis, so that we can have a model of cash flow projections. And our plan is to incorporate cash flow analysis in all of our quarterly financial reports. Um, I've gathered some samples from other communities and I think I've done this well. I shared, I think I sent two, three weeks ago, a couple of samples uh, with Andrew. And therefore we're actually working on that very subject um, to kind of start doing that cash flow analysis and, and incorporating it into our quarterly report in addition to just the budget reporting piece. That's excellent. And just to add to, to what Linda was saying, um, we're also, and I know Linda, you did this analysis, looking back at, you know, various black swan events in the past to assess, you know, what was the impact on our tax collections, given that July 1 is the next time we're going to be receiving a big influx of, of uh, tax payments. And you found that tax collection rates remained extremely high. I think you said above, you know, 98.5%, which is the amount that we typically budget for anyway, even in those very stressful you know, market scenarios. So, um, so obviously, you know, that this pandemic is something that no one has seen in a hundred years. Um, but at least if, you know, past uh, experience with black swan events tells us anything, it says that taxes have still been coming in. And we looked at even, you know, what percentage of, of taxes are escrowed, um, you know, so that, you know, since obviously that escrowing process has been, you know, happening over the last several months. So those tax payments should still be delivered timely. It's really on the folks who don't have an underlying mortgage who pay the town directly that we need to be really looking out for. Yeah, Linda, Linda this is Chuck. Um, in, in your analysis you're putting together, are you incorporating sensitivities on that? Like what if? Like what if, what if the, what if the, you know, for example, I think the governor is, has asked the banks to kind of do something with respect to allowing people not to pay their mortgages and so on. And has, has uh, maybe reduced interest rates and those kinds of things. So maybe even the um, escrow people won't be necessarily paying their taxes for, for three or four months. Um, so it's just hard to, but in any case, maybe sensitivities uh, along the lines of particularly the revenue side, uh, just to be able to know when, you know, what <clears throat> certain things, um, you know, could impact in what way, and then uh, to track it on a, on a, you know, current basis like you're doing. But it sounds really good what you're doing. Hey, Chuck, I, two things about that. One is the governor issued an order the other day that requires us, all towns and cities in Connecticut, to adopt one of two cho choices either giving taxpayers 90 day deferment starting July 1st or reducing our interest rate from 18% to 3%. Mm -hmm. Both of those options, and we'll probably pick the interest rate, rate one, uh, will give people an incentive not to pay on time. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, historically we haven't had, and, and when it comes to people with mortgages, my guess is that since most securities, most uh, mortgages are securitized, and the, the, the agent who's collecting the taxes would have no, I, I don't think you can instruct your uh, mortgage lender to not collect your, not, not, uh, not remit your taxes once they've been uh, escrowed. So I, I don't anticipate we're gonna have a big effect from this uh, really unprecedented order by the governor. I mean, it's nice to give people a break, 
Uh, most of our residents don't need a break, uh, and they, some may choose a 3% interest <clears throat> rather than paying on time. But you know, we, we can look at that in terms of sensitivity. Yeah, I think that's, a, uh, Chuck and I talked about this a little bit. I think um, Chuck and I are a little bit from Missouri on um, the cash flows and the payment of taxes. I think we, you know, we, we see it, um, we're, we're happy to be wrong, but we see it as being much more negative than that. And I guess I would ask um, um, Andrew um, or Linda, do you, do you guys, uh, what is the percentage of commercial real estate in the overall tax collection versus residential? Uh, I have a chart on that. I, I can, I'll try and get it before the meeting is over while somebody else is presenting. Yeah, it's small. I, I had it broken down by that. It's small. Yeah, it's, about uh, Kev, it's about Do you 6%. remember, Kevin? I don't recall. It's about 6%. It's not, you know, we're, okay. we're, we're, we're largely a residential town, so most of our taxes are coming through so homeowners. It's, yeah, six, so it's under 10%, for sure. Yeah, okay. That's good. Yeah, well, anyway, you guys got the, you guys got it. I mean, we just, I mean, I guess this gets, you know, if we have a, if we just don't have the cash, what, what, what how do we deal with that? And if we, if that happens at the same time, um, the, the municipal bonding market freezes on us, you know, what do we do in terms of making payroll? And that, that's sort of what we're asking. And, and as long as you got, a, as long as we have a plan for that, that that's fine. You know, another thing to mention is that the federal government's aid, which is uh, Connecticut is supposed to get a, a billion five to distribute to the towns and cities. Uh, I don't know how much McCain will get for that, but um, I suspect that they're going to focus it on the cities who need it. <laughs> uh, but and also FEMA has kicked in so that all of our COVID related expenses um, uh, will be reimbursable either at 75%, which was the initial Trump order, or hopefully they'll move it to 100% like New York State. Kevin, would that, is that billion five include this sub, is that just a general public subsidy or does that include the hospitals? And That's a good question because, you know, the governor just came out, I think, with an estimate that the state's going to take a hit of 1.9 billion. I think the, the rainy day fund for the state was like 2.7 2, 2. Mm -hmm. 2. billion um, coming into uh, the last few months. So the state's somewhat positioned to absorb a large amount and they're going to get 1.5 billion from the federal government. I don't know whether it flows down to hospitals or just down th through the municipalities. Yeah. Well, we'll just print, we'll just print another trillion. Yeah. All right. Bill, uh, um, one, I would think most one, of the one, hospitals are, you know, the COVID expenses for the hospitals is, is, is largely probably insured and the insurance companies are, you know, are, are waiving co-pays and stuff. So there's a lot of different factors that are coming yeah. into play. Yeah. Yeah. The economics of this, I mean, the, the bookkeeping on this will take a long time to get sorted out for sure. Mm. Um, I mean, Bill, this is Andrew. Um, one, one other thing I want to point out on the liquidity front, you know, the town does have a sizable amount of liquid uh, funds or funds invested in short term securities like operating cash that if we need to, we have that, we, we do have a cushion, um, you know, like we have um, at least $20 million um, sitting with uh, Jenny Montgomery, uh, Scott, um, UBS Wealth Management. Um, you know, obviously our goal would not to be to, you know, draw down too much on our fund balance, but we do have a lot of, you know, we do have many millions of dollars as a cushion um, if we need to tap into that. Obviously, we don't want to sell off securities, though, you know, if, if some of those funds are invested in. in um, Andrew, you know, well, how, much, how much of those might be needed for the next three months? Or is that just all extra beyond that? No, no, all, like all those funds are, are essentially in, in invested because they are not even anticipated. They were not anticipated to even be drawn down from. Um, it's just excess uh, monies that the town has uh, received from past year tax collections, as well as just investment, um, you know, income over the last several years. Um, so, so, so those accounts have grown. We've never needed to draw down from them. I think one, we, we actually, when the teacher contracts changed and we had to uh, pay a balloon payment starting at the beginning of the summer, at that time, we did have to draw down a couple of those accounts, but they were fully replenished, um, you know, following, uh, you know, past, uh, bond issuances, you know, as well as, you know, paying for projects before we've bonded, you know, like those have typically been the, the use cases for drawing from, from those reserve funds. 
You know, uh, maybe maybe not on this call, but maybe uh, Andrew, you and Linda, and then we could pick it up offline or however we want to do it. But um, since you know, since the town is a not-for-profit, fundamentally, right? We're not in business for a profit. Could you could you just uh, give a little thought? Maybe you have the answer. You know, how is it that we actually have twenty million dollars stashed away that we don't need? <laughs> Well, I think par part of it is um, in order to maintain our AAA rating, we have to have a certain percentage of our total operating funds in reserve. Um, I believe, uh, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, or Linda, I think it's like at least 15% is like the gold standard, and we're above that 15%. I think we're more at like the 20% level. Yeah, um, I think, I think Moody's, requir Moody's requirement is 10% to be a AAA. And we're at 18 or 20 percent right now, so we have a big rainy day fund. That's that's our that's our general fund balance that's uh, that's invested partly. But I guess my point that is a rainy day fund, right? So it's it's not committed to anything else. So that's right. Fund, fundamentally, we we over collected taxes to the tune of 18 million. Because we because we're required to. I mean, if in order to be a, a triple A rated, you have yeah. to have yeah. um, three months of uh, expenditures in reserve, and we have. We have more than that, so. Right. Um, I, Good. But so it's not committed to something else. There is. That's right. Just general. That's right. It as a rainy. Great. Good. Great. Right. Okay. You know, we yeah. could we we could perhaps invest. We're not allowed to by state law to borrow from banks, and most of our debt is held by individual investors and, and bond funds. But we could perhaps uh, investigate. We we could issue a say a five million dollar bond to a bank. Um, uh, but we so we we perhaps should investigate that. But I really don't think we're gonna, we're going to have a cash flow problem. Yeah. Okay. I think we spent. I think we covered spent enough time on. Yeah, yeah. Linda. In George. Yeah, Linda, you can go ahead and continue with your. I think George of, had a question. Yeah, okay. Can I get in here for a second? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering: Are we keeping an eye on our pension fund? I know we've been very proud of our overfunding, but with the collapse of the stock market, are we staying on top of where we are and? Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are no risks, but I think maybe we're getting a little bit closer to just being funded. Um, and also OPEC, are we going to be making OPEC contributions this year? Yes, George. We, uh, Diane, uh, there's a subcommittee of the Board of Finance that looks at that. And uh, I think even with the market down 30%, um, we're still head and shoulders above others with our both our pension fund and especially our OPEB fund. You know, most people have a fraction of what they need for their OPEB obligations. So we're okay. still um, comfortably overfunded in our uh, pension. Well, we were at 107% back in January. I don't- yeah, Where are we now? <laughs> uh, stay in. Yeah, I, we, I, we'll get you the number. Linda, do you recall the yeah. analysis that Diane did? I don't, I know there's something Diane they and circulated. I'll get that and forward that to the to the audit committee. Okay, Great. thank you. Okay, so why don't we uh, why don't we plow ahead with the uh, item three sure. and uh, well, let's, let's, pick let's, up on whatever we didn't cover and then Joanne. Otherwise, I don't want to keep everybody all day. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe. the one thing Chuck, you wanted to know where we stood on um, on the mill rate. So I've shared this chart, so I'm not going to go over it with you yeah. in detail. But basically, it starts with the recommended the budget that we're in now and then all the phases of budget development up until last night. And so you'll see that the very bottom in terms of where we stand now as far as the mill rate, um, right now the mill rate sits at 18.029, which is down slightly from the 18.240 uh, that, that's adopted in the current year. Now there are two things that could impact that. Obviously there's the Board of Assessment um, has been going through a, a reviewing appeals, um, and I'll get that final number, I think, either later today or Monday, and that will tell us what the final grand list will be, and therefore, depending on what happens there, I'll know by how much that number changes. Um, and then on Tuesday at the Board of Finance meeting, when they set the mill rate, they will uh, they'll make a decision whether they still want to keep that mill uh, fund balance drawdown at $5 million, if they keep it at 5 million, that mill rate would not change by much. But if they change that number, obviously you have to make up that revenue uh, by way of property tax collections and that may influence the mill rate. Uh, but 
as of today, that's where the mill rate stands. Yeah, I might. What, what were the, just a couple of things of, of note, I think that the 5 million, which is, uh, uh, was a contribution from the fund balance, that, that was um, what originally four. Uh, four, and I think last year it was three, right? Um, so it's gone from yeah. three to four. It's gone yeah, from three to four. As the highest I, we've I been, Chuck, Chuck, the highest we've been in the past 10 years is five. Right, it was three last year and then it's gone to five this year, right? Partly because last year we had a swing, unusual swing of $5 million from uh, underspending to, to uh, over collection of revenues. Right. So, so, so if somehow, let's say the, the following year, if, if um, let, let's say we don't have revenues that are, we don't have a positive situation like that, then the mill rate gets hit by that five million. Right. Yeah. Next, next year. So if you look at even, at even this year, where you see we, we have an estimated four million drawdown, um, I don't anticipate that's happening. That, that's the budget number. Uh, we've already collected, we're already at 99% of our revenue collections uh, for the year. And uh, we've exceeded the tax collections because of how we budget for taxation. And we're not going to, go ahead. I was thinking in terms of, of 21 and then looking forward to 22. Words, right. So what I'm saying is going into 21, we're, we're going into 21 with the budget assumption of drawing down $4 million in this year by June 30th. Um, we are not going to draw down $4 million by June 30th. So the starting position going into 21 is better than what we're budgeting for. I thought you're okay. You. You're budgeting enough. Okay, I, well, we can talk later. You, know, you may recall you were uh, at your last meeting. I think you questioned the one million dollars of uh, uncollected taxes, and the, it had grown because of your pointing that out. Uh, there was one taxpayer that owed four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and we simply sent a, a, a letter threatening a tax sale, and he paid up three hundred of the four hundred thousand dollars. That's great. That's a residential owner, and. Uh, so we, we don't have a lot of uncollected taxes. It's great. Did I hear something that the president may be uh, taking, uh, changing the tax laws to um, allow full deduction of property and other taxes, again, local taxes again? I think you were dreaming. <laughs> no, 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 I heard it. But, uh, but, uh, I think... Well, he's, I think he's, trying to, he's trying to figure out ways to get money in people's pockets. That would be one fast way. I think, I think he's actively proposing 100% deduction on meals. <laughs> okay. Just wanted right. to introduce a little levity into the subject. Okay. And that's all I have. I'll toss it to Joanne to go over the Board of Ed. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Yeah. Thank you. And we can see everybody. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, one thing to to mention about uh, the the fund balance at year end today, uh, this year in twenty. Uh, the Board of Education anticipates underspending their budget based on, you know, the fact that we're not operating the buildings right now. And so, whatever that number is, we're going to try to give you a range in the near future. Uh, you'll be able to, you know, add that to your um, analysis in terms of what's available uh, for future years. Uh, so just to quickly go through our budget, we started at 1.47%. Uh, it included about a $2 million uh, reduction in our health insurance plan, uh, our contributions actually to the Internal Services Fund. And that was really the result of um, years of negotiating down uh, with our unions to the high deductible health plan, uh, which resulted in our reestablishing our base for claims. So we have this um, opportunity this year to reduce the requirements from taxpayers uh, because of that particular item. Also included in our request was uh, $955,000 for uh, start in, uh, the change in start and end times, uh, which we've been talking about for quite a while now. And, um, and so that all, the, all those things combined with our regular operating budget came in at 1.47. When we went through the Board of Finance, uh, they reduced our budget by $752,000 uh, 
but 500 of that was really shifting the reserve policy um, contribution. Uh, it was 60% the Board of Ed, 40% the town, and we just basically flipped that uh, to be 40% um, Board of Ed, 60% town. Uh, mm. be here. Um, and so uh, the other 200,000 came from salary accounts and turnover savings. Last night we were cut, uh, I believe it was 1,143, Lunda, which brings our yes. budget down to um, a negative 0.61% right now. So we'll be looking at that over the next uh, several weeks to see how we can manage that. And uh, we'll report out what we come up with. As far as capital goes, uh, our budget request was uh, 4,915,850. That's what was approved by the Board of Finance. Lunda had gotten, uh, touched base with us a few weeks ago and asked us what we could defer at least 100 days. So we went through the total list. Um, 765,350 was from tax supported and 4,150,500 was from bonded. Um, of the bonded, we wanted to keep in there the east roof replacement. That's very important to us to get that done this summer. We also have water incursion uh, remediation at east that we need to do. And we have playground repairs at south that are really a safety issue that we wanted to keep in there. Those are all bonded. And we also asked to keep 20,000 in out of the tax supported for the time being uh, for light replacement, exterior light replacement at SACS. Um, so at the end of the day, most of our tax supported uh, capital items have been deferred with the exception of 20,000, uh, which we requested. Joanne, um, I don't want to get into the debate of early, early um, the bus, the, bu the buses, you know, the kids going to school early or later. There's a lot of people weighing in on that. But just the idea, just looking at that, I, I understand you're going to change the hours for the next year. And, that the, and therefore, there's been money added to the budget for that. And if, if that if that is correct, is there any possibility, just as an example, of delaying that change one more year? I realize at some point you got to make a decision and do it, but is there any opportunity to say, well, it's a great idea, but we just can't do it this year. Um, we're going to delay it till next year. You know, it, the pandemic may stretch into the summer, or is it is that something we just have to do now because whatever the reason is? And then there would be a whole bunch of other questions you might ask. Right. Well, just just to um, I'll just jump in quickly. Um, I, the decision was made last night, essentially, with a one point one million dollar cut not to do it next year. Uh, okay. That has it has to be. Uh, you know, it's the largest initiative in the budget, and short of taking that out, we'd have to eviscerate core programs throughout the system. So uh, that's part of that. One point one is going to be the money that was included that was in the budget for school start times that we're no longer able to fund. Question I sort of had was um, during the summertime. Um, I mean, if we had the if we had restrictions on social kind, you know, social distancing during the summer, um, do, do we have a lot of are the teachers involved? In a lot of programs which are somewhat discretionary in the sense that you know if the kids can't go to school and social distancing, they wouldn't do, and and therefore that might impact their salary. I was just wondering and. And if that was the not, case, not budgetarily. No, the teachers that are involved for the most part are in our um, summer programming, but that's run outside of our main budget. As you know, it's its own fund and that's a self um, funding program. So the tuition pays for it. We have a small group that does special education services in our extended school year program and some other costs there, but it's certainly not anything um, sizable. Right. Good. This might be a good year to um, um, advertise some of the. Um, 501c3s that I know you don't have them, but others have on behalf of the schools because of the uh, relief the president has given on contributions um, in terms of tax contributions. So you might, you know, next well, time. I'll tell you, our, our, our PTCs, you know, our parent groups are fundraising and purchasing yeah. gift cards, getting them to us. We're getting them to the homes of families that need them. Um, yeah. There's some significant, really amazing generosity and, uh, you know, good work on others' behalf going on all throughout, all throughout town. Yep. And one thing okay. to well is that um, our budget is substantially, you know, as you know, salaries and benefits, 82%. Uh, 
And when we start school in the beginning of the year, our staffing plan is basically established. So while there is some flexibility in terms of, you know, certain positions, you know, the, the real staffing issues that we have um, are resolved before the first day of school. Yeah. So just speaking to what you had mentioned before, it's, it's really kind of tough for boards of ed to midstream start cutting uh, programs. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I understand. And that, that my follow-on question, if you could do that, was, you know, in business, you can get funding from the government for that. And the question might be around the 501c3s, the summer programs. If they're in the 501c3 and you had to cut them, you might be able to get some funding. Is there funding available for that? But hopefully we won't get to that point. Okay. Um, are there any other observations either um, Linda, Linda's part or Joanne's part in terms of item three? Anything else we want to cover? Um, no, not for me. Great. Joanne, you okay? We're good. Yeah. Good. Uh, Linda, I thought you might be discussing um, the, the governor's, uh, some of the executive orders and the impact. We touched on one or two, but are there other things you wanted to cover? Uh, sure. So can you guys see this? Yes. So the governor so far has issued um, 20 executive orders from executive order seven to 17. And so what I did was to kind of, uh, I'll share this document, I'm not gonna go into any detail. Some of them have no impact on, on the town or the board of ed, um, some do. Obviously the very first one uh, referred to the 180 day uh, school year. Uh, there were some that didn't have an impact, but the ones that I think impacted the town the most, I'll highlight those, and maybe Joanne, you can talk about some that impact um, um, the board of ed. Um, I think the big one for us was, uh, the first one was the uh, adoption of the budget deadlines, uh, which was on March 15th. Um, and so that was one where we had the option to do the 30 day, the 30 day extension to the budget process. I talked about this before at the very beginning as to why the town exists didn't exercise uh, that option. Um, the other one that impacted the town significantly um, had to do with assessment um, and taxation and days when those could be appealed. Again, as I mentioned before, because of our calendar, we start fairly early. But by the time that came out, uh, Kevin and I checked with the tax assessor to, to see, hey, is there an impact on this on us? Uh, they were far along in the process where it wasn't going to impact us. The Board of Assessment Appeals had gone to Zoom and uh, phone calls uh, to review their appeals, and so they felt that there was no need to extend the appeal deadline. So they kept their schedule and completed their appeals process uh, either via Zoom or via, um, via, via phone calls. So that didn't have uh, an extensive impact on us. Um, Linda, there I was, Linda. Uh, I, sure. would mention, I would like to mention, though, that the Board of Assessment Appeals kind of killed us this year. Um, they, they sort of disregarded some of SEBI's technical advice about values, and um, so we're disappointed that the Board of Assessment Appeals, how many total assessments were there? But you know, we had some big houses that were coming down from $5 million to $3 million, and some of them were justified, but they really, they really gave us more than we needed. So... Yes, I think preliminary numbers, and we'll get those final numbers hopefully by the end of the day. Um, SEBI estimates that we're looking at about $27 million reduction in the grant list. That's how much they, um, uh, they, gave, they gave up from the $7.7 .7 billion grant list. Uh, but we'll see what that final number says. This is compared to last year where we had a significantly more number of appeals just because it was a reval year. Um, and that year, I believe we had 33 million. So we had 33 million last year reduction. This year we have 27 with a fewer number far of few, appeals. Far, far, far fewer. And far, the non grant list. Far fewer appeals. So, far fewer. Kevin, so if I understand this, uh, just um, a, a year ago, 18 months ago, we went through a, the every five year evaluation and there were a whole bunch of appeals and the grand list went down 33. And this year, just in the normal course of business, people appealed and it went down another 27. Yeah, but far fewer. We had like one quarter of the number of appeals. And keep in mind, they have to go back and, and say, what was the value on October 1, 2018? Not right. currently, not 2019, 2018. And for some reason, and we really, we need, probably need better 
or different uh, members of the board. It's an elected position. Um, and they really, I think, look too much at what was happening now than what was happening back in October of 2018. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. You know, so we, we want to be fair, but we also want, don't want to be screwed. So. All right. No, I agree. You know, an interesting thing, just while we're on sort of the grand list, um, um, I understand that um, it's also probably impacts, well, I don't know if it impacts the Board of Education or not, but it probably does, uh, that the, I believe the number of rentals in town are up pretty significantly recently. Which, know, is good, which, which is good in a way. I mean, and actually, we, we, we should benefit from purchases uh, coming out of New York City. So that's, that's one of yeah. the effects. There's been a lot of talk about this in the past week about the number of New Yorkers coming up to either rent or go, uh, or come to our hospitals. You know, it's, it's tragic what's happening in New York City, but we are likely to benefit with our real estate market because of it. Yeah, oh, that was my point. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um, and then I think the other big one was, um, was the one that we just talked about that came out um, on Tuesday about the, the tax deadlines. Um, and the option that we have. Um, and so the governor in that executive order, like Kevin mentioned, we had a couple of options, either a deferment program, uh, the low interest rate program. Um, he did, however, as I read the executive order, the, the, um, the payments are in escrow. Uh, those escrow holders are required to disperse those um, to the towns unless that, unless the, 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 the homeowner um, shows extreme um, hardships um, and somehow requests that that escrow amount not be distributed, but given back to them. Uh, but from what I, how I read it is the escrow payments, which is about 35% of our grand list uh, values that is due July 1st, uh, that is not impacted. So that'll still come through, which is about $42 million or so by, uh, by, by August. I should uh, so that should come through. Linda, didn't, didn't, uh, back to and I would, I would really encourage all those, um, you know, who are, who are charged with taking a look at, um, you know, the cash flows we talked about and the contingency plans. Uh, you know, I know we have very generous people in town, but th those generous people have right now uh, down a little bit. have lost a lot to their investment portfolio. And if things are get worse, They'll go down. They'll go down really dramatically, and um, you know it's pretty easy to make a decision to not pay your taxes rather than sell security to pay your taxes. So um, we just need to. We none of us have ever experienced this before, so we just need to do the very best we can. And Kevin, I I, I thought your suggestion earlier of you know talking to a bank and have a line of credit is not a bad idea because most of the corporations and most of the partnerships, everybody who had any um, lines of credit basically drew them down um, to, to access the liquidity. Um, and um, because, you know, in 2008, liquidity dried up and that's why so many places went bankrupt. And that's why the federal government is putting so much in. But at some point, they're going to have to say uncle and uh, can't put any more in. So um, I would just be um, extremely cautious on, on the cash flows coming in. We, we don't know how people are going to behave. And I would I might even not only um, arrange for a line, like you said earlier, but I might even draw it down. To be with you. you know, perhaps we could, uh, perhaps we could go, most of our bonds when we sell them are, are bought by the big bond funds like BlackRock and Goldman Sachs. And, and perhaps, you know, we could test, we could talk to the investment bankers about placing, because we have to do it by direct placement. We, we can't have a line of credit with a bank. We, we have to have a placement of a bond, but that might be something that, uh, we should look into. I'd also like to give some further color on the deferment program because under the two options we have and the town council has to decide this, if you get, if you, if someone wants to deferment, if we, we have to either adopt the 90 day deferment, but you have to certify that you've been damaged by the COVID crisis. So a lot of our commercial businesses can probably qu qualify for that. The, the low interest rate, eight, 3% per annum rather than 18% requires no certification, no, no evidence of damage. So, I don't know what, we, we really have to analyze which one would likely produce more deferrals. Uh, and uh, we're gonna have to do that sensitivity, sensitivity analysis to see which program we ought to go with. Right, okay, cool. Um, in terms of cash flow, the, the vehicle that 
local governments typically use um, rather than go to a bank, um, and Joe, you may speak to this as well, are um, tax anticipation notes. Mm -hmm. And so these are short-term borrowing tools uh, that local governments have, and it still has the tax, um, it still has the preferential tax treatment in anticipation of taxes. So this would be a case where, you know, our taxes are delayed 90 days, um, and so in anticipation, we could go out and get these tax anticipation notes for a short-term period and then pay back. Uh, typically, they're below 12 months. Um, so that's, that's a tool that uh, local governments that are in, uh, have li liquidity issues have gone out for, um, and that's probably what I would look at first if we were to go down that route uh, before going to banks just because of its preferential tax treatment. Yeah, and right now, right now rates are so low. I'm why not? Why not just do it? I mean, but you know, I'll let uh, Todd and the Finance Committee and Kevin and Linda look at that. But uh, I, I think we would. It does add to your debt profile. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have Bob Spangler on the Board of Finance and Amy Carroll Murphy are both municipal market people, and I, I think we ought to investigate this, Linda. Okay. Great. So um, the next um, topic. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Linda. Yep, you're still. No, I'm this. done. Unless Joanne wanted to talk about executive orders on the board of that side. Joanne? Um, I, Brian, if you want to add in and then I can add the financial um, dimension to it. Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, really, the executive orders are coming out very quickly and actually with, uh, we're working very closely with the commissioner um, to sort of give them, um, point them in a direction around the decisions that need to be made you know, where we are in the state is different than where other regions of the state and other school districts and, and areas. So it's hitting us first, as you know, as it comes up from the city. So um, one of the most significant, of course, was the initially there was a waiver process we had to apply for in order to count our distance learning days as school days. Uh, we received that waiver, but then the next day they flipped and uh, went to what New Jersey and some others have done to say that uh, just by virtue of the fact that it's closed due to the, uh, the health department and because of the pandemic uh, that they wound up saying we no longer have to report out 180 complete days of school. Um, so they asked us to get going as quickly as we can with our distance learning and to do it. So they waived the 180 day requirement. That was a very big thing. Uh, it was important for labor. It was important for kids and families and everybody else. Um, you know, they've been doing a number of other things, including executive orders talking about maintaining the employees on the payroll. Uh, you know, trying to keep that keep that moving forward. They've done things such as, you know, teacher evaluation being suspended for the remainder of the year. Um, they've allowed districts to make their own decision around spring break. As you know, right now the governor's close goes to until April 20th, which is uh, the date that we picked earlier. Uh, but we're fully anticipating an executive order by the 10th that pushes that out at least to the end of the month, if not beyond, as you, as you guys know. Um, is really a lot of back and forth with us and the commissioner. So, um, you know, on the financial side, there, there's more to it, bus contracts and other pieces. But, uh, you know, it's been a swiftly moving target, as you know. It's, uh, I think they're down to S, 7S, as far as the executive orders go. Uh, Londa, would you put yours, yours back up on the screen just so I can see if there are, I just don't sure. have it in front of me, uh, if there's anything else specifically to education that uh, would be helpful just to mention. Can you, you see? Yep, got it. Thank you. Um, you know, the suspension of in-person media requirements, some of those things, the uh, FOI Act was a big one. Suspension of that, the need to be in public if you do certain things. Um, let's see, just scroll down for me. I think, uh, you know, this other things, of course, you know, I could talk for hours about things like the student data privacy and those pieces. They did give us the ability to extend the budget deadline, as Linda mentioned. We've chosen not to do that because, uh, you know, what we're doing now by running this distance learning program and keeping everybody engaged and healthy moving forward is really taking up all of our bandwidth. Um, the, uh, let's see if there's anything else really important there. No. No, I think unless you have any other questions, it's, uh, you know, they keep coming. And the data privacy was important because we're problem solving using the, 
you know, the uh, vendors that are available. They have to conform to Connecticut's uh, guidelines, but we don't have to negotiate a separate agreement with them. And typically what we've had to do is they'd agree to conform and then we'd have to put another layer on top of that to uh, have them sign a, an agreement locally in every district. There's so much redundancy in it because we all have to do the same thing. Uh, now we don't have to do that anymore as we go through this, so. Right. What was that on? Well, you, what is it you don't have to do? That's the student data privacy. Uh, okay. What we had to do in the past is negotiate individually. Now the state's saying as long as they agree to conform to the state, they're good. So that's given us enough flexibility to keep the distance learning program and other programs moving forward. Great, great, thank you. It's a good time to be um, retired with a funded pension plan or, or working for a strong, strong organization like um, government organization or some of the others. But you know, lots of people, unfortunately, are not as lucky as the collective group we're talking about here, which is, you know, Hey, Bill, could I ask, uh, Joe is on here and being rather quiet, but uh, could I ask him whether we miss anything with the governor's orders from his experience with other towns? Hey, Linda, could you take that uh, screen off? Take it off? Sure. Okay. Let's go. Joe? Yeah, so what was... But uh, have you, I have, from what you've seen in other towns or your own town, are we missing anything with the governor's orders? They're hard, awfully hard to keep up with. And <laughs> yeah, no, I I think all all the highlights were, were were covered. I mean, the big one right now is what to do with the taxes. So I'm getting some calls on on that as far as which program to go into, uh, and it probably impacts towns that have quarterly payments more so than semi-annual as far as the what, what you would actually be deferring. Um, but everything you talked about is kind of really what, 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 what's going on. You know, what I'm looking at my town is just a similar thing you talked about. What can I save in, in the current budget and use to help uh, fund the next budget, whether it be capital or those type of things. Uh, so just using those type of strategies to, to try to manage down whatever tax increase you're, you're, you don't have a tax increase, just a little bit ahead, depending on equity, but. How about this deferral thing? Have you seen anybody analyzing this as to? I, I haven't yet. I just got a call from one client that wanted to talk about it. So I, I, I might have a little bit more information later on on that, um, but, but right now it's it's just because it, it just passed two days ago. I, I haven't uh, even looked at it for my town or, or other than the one call, which I haven't returned yet uh, on that. So I can certainly, you know, share whatever I learned, what other strategies some other towns are using once I have that information. But it's just for 90 days from what, I, I haven't focused on the details myself, 90 days starting July 1st or? Or I, earlier, I it, there's a March deadline in there, so I think it's really for the balance of this year. I don't think they were doing anything for July one. I think it was really March 10th. I don't know why that that's a, a date they're using to, to June 30. So how does that work though? I mean, most our real estate taxes are collected. So how, are we looking just at other revenues than than real estate? I mean, it applies to several things besides just real estate tax. Right. Right. So, so it'd be more, like I said, I think it affects, we'll say like town of Fairfield is a quarterly payment. So they have an April one payment. So it affects those towns differently. I got you. Okay. Then, then a town that has semi-annuals. So that's where you're, you'd probably be looking more at the interest program only because like you said, most people have paid. It'd be just the people who haven't paid uh, the interest break. So, okay. Cause Linda, someone did an analysis and said it would only impact for hundreds eighty-seven thousand dollars. I I didn't understand that analysis, but I was thinking it was July first and not March first. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's March. I, I mean, I go I'll go back once I uh, go over that. But I, they were using March tenth as a, de a date. So whether you if you were delinquent starting March tenth, I'm, I'm not sure again what the relevance to that date is. But I'm going to go back and verify that. Well, it makes more sense to give people relief now than wait until July. But but also some the calculate who made the calculation, Linda. Uh, Amy Carroll Morphy, or somebody made the calculation, and I didn't understand where they were getting the numbers. It might, it might have been Tom Butterworth, I think, perhaps. Uh, Tom I think it was Tom, and I haven't looked at it yet. Yeah, yeah. 
so that's actually the impact is much less than uh, I was anticipating July. It's really now and our taxes are already paid uh, for the year or so. And, and as I mentioned, I, I thought they were giving some relief on people paying their mortgages starting about March. Well, that's and, mortgages and, and that's only uh, the bank, big bank. The big that, comes that, are, the, that comes to the escrow maybe, just the escrow question. Yeah. Bill, it's Rob Fryer. Can I just make a point on this executive order um, in, in terms of contingency planning? Um, I mean, it's, it, it, it's good what Joe just said, if it's just uh, this, this uh, second quarter of the year, my, April through June. But we should probably, I would suggest, uh, the town should look at uh, a scenario where the governor issues another order, which would cover July 1. I mean, it depends how long this shutdown uh, and the, um, yeah, the, this, this, the present situation continues, but it lasts, if it lasts into summer, I mean, there's every possibility the governor will issue another executive order, which would affect July. So in terms of which choice we should make, it doesn't seem as though it affects us too much now. But it wouldn't be a bad idea, I think, to have a look at, you know, what would we do if there's another executive order which would affect our July 1 payments. Mm -hmm. Joanne, have I, you heard anything? I think for the tri-state area that, you know, I mean, no one knows, but very well could be, because I can't imagine that, you know, there's going to be a day when we have no, a day in the near future when we have no restrictions. So, but who knows? But I think that's a good point. Um, yeah, what that was, happens that's if, what point. Tax our July payments. I guess that's the question, and we should be looking at that now. And hopefully, it won't. Okay, great. Everybody um, have what they want. Everybody have a chance to input on executive orders. Great, thank you. The next topic is uh, topic uh, uh, topic five, which is the uh, 2020 independent auditor. We have we have to go through a process on this. I think um, um, you know I've. I've need to speak to Brian, need to speak to Kevin, and then uh, the audit committee um, come back with a recommendation, which I guess goes to Kevin and to, if I'm not mistaken, to um, to John Engel as well, given his role. And, you know, we're inclined to um, uh, stay with uh, Joe's firm, PKF, uh, for this current year. This would be a very difficult year to bring another firm in, um, because in some respects, there's no place to bring them in to. Um, you know, at least right now. And also, I think uh, directionally from a fee standpoint, I'll let Chuck talk about the detail, but um, we have to go through a process, Kevin, on this. And, um, uh, you know, we'll do that in due, in due course. But just, just an update, Chuck, why don't you maybe, you know, I know you work with Joe on some of the numbers. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, first, I talked to, to Lunda a little bit and um, just to get, and, and Joanne, I think, uh, to just get feedback as to, to you know, whether there's any reason why we should not consider just, um, you know, uh, recommending um, PKF again for for this year. And and I believe the feedback was that, uh, no, there's, there's, you know, no reason why we would want to do that from a service point of view um, or from, well, from a service point of view. And so then I, we went to uh, Joe and just asked for a, a proposed fee for, for this year's audit. And which he provided, which was uh, provided on a flat basis with respect to last year. And I'm looking for, for Joe to shake his head. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So, so we, you know, uh, I think that that was, um, that, that was good. And so, so, um, you know, I, and I think we circulated to everybody, um, a history of the fees over the past, what, five years, I think, or something like that, that, that you put together. And, um, um, so, so you know, I think from from the committee's point of view, even even without the crisis, I, th I think that we would uh, we would be recommending this. But certainly, with that, it makes no sense to think about anything else, and certainly not at this point. And then, um, Joe, do you have anything that you want to add? No, I, I I think because we weren't aware of the timing, I think we would add be more efficient in the process if we can't come on site than, than trying to, to, to use a different order since we're, at least we're familiar with the people and the systems and that type of thing just could 
I don't know how much remote auditing we're going to have to do, depending on when, 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 when this, uh, um, when all the restrictions, when, when they get released. And yeah. we definitely appreciate the confidence in the firm and, and would like to continue working with the town. Bill, it's, it's Rob. Uh, I, I, I had nothing to do with the previous, any of the previous audits, obviously, so cannot comment on that. You know, I've heard what everyone said, but I, I have taken a look through um, the uh, the engagement letter, which is in the in the papers for the meeting, and I have no comments or questions on that. It looks fine to me, and um, the rationale for continuing with uh, Joe's firm, you know, I fully support. Okay, I think that's all, Bill. Bill, you might be on mute. I'm not sure. Yeah, you're on mute. So we'll go through a process, but that's the direction we're going in, hopefully for the, for the next meeting. Um, hey, Tom, is that, is that, uh, you have a bum hanging on your wall up there? Is that, I just noticed that. That's, there you that's go. A, if, you, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you, you can do a thumb. Oh, is there, is there, I didn't realize that. I guess. Yeah. Or I can do a hand clap. <laughs> I, I guess on the, some of the corporate Zooms I'm on, we don't have thumbs on our screen, I guess. <laughs> but um, that's good. Um, I think you're just going. Well, I'm sorry. There you go. Um, okay. Um, the next thing is on the internal audit a, a little bit. I thought I think um, any any suggestion to go through a process right now probably doesn't make any sense. So, uh, Kevin, um, talk to you. I'll talk to you and Brian afterwards. But I think we'd like to just delay in the RFP process till, um, you know, maybe plan on having the, the, the last quarter of, the, the, you know, for about three quarters by the time we go through the process and hire the firm, save a few dollars in that regard as well. We think it's important to have an independent internal audit process, but be unrealistic to ask people to go through a process now to really interview firms and so on as the case may be. So we're going to be, we're going to be suggesting that we just, keep the concept, but just delay replacing uh, QM for a little while since we haven't done it yet. And um, I know that all of you have met Ted, a member of QM, and uh, Dave and Moran, and, and you, you know that both of them came down with cancer uh, very close to the same time. And um, George reports to me that, that Ted passed away actually three or four weeks ago. Oh. Right, right. He, didn't know, uh, he was quite I think Dave is uh, uh, taking uh, under treatment, and uh, he's made um, some suggestion that he might be retiring. So uh, uh, that's Dave. That's that's Dave. Yeah, that's Dave. So Dave, Ted yeah. with Dave. So I think I think staying with the Cume, you know, yeah. it's trying to move away from them, but also, we, also we wouldn't have the same team back. So yeah. that's yeah. where we are. Yeah, and, and then. I, I, I think we're not doing any more work with the QM, right? No, we're so, not. And then um, item item seven is the review of the most uh, current financial statements. Um, Linda and Joanne, if you maybe you could just uh, each say a few words about that, and then we can let everybody go back to um, doing some crisis work. Okay. Um, sure. As I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 mine is fairly quick. Um, you have the financials in front of you um, at this point. Um, everything is trending. These were, um, as of February 28th, up, up until that point, there was no um, the impact of, of COVID. Hadn't, um, doesn't reflect in any of those financials um, at this particular time. Um, and so everything is normal. Our property tax revenues and revenue collections are on track. We're at about 99%. On the expenditure side, we're also on track. And there's as Joanne mentioned on the Board of Ed side, they look to come under um, as a result of the, um, the closure of the facilities. It will be similar on our end uh, with the exception. We have started tracking uh, COVID related expenses on, on the town side and I know the Board of Ed has started to do the same. Um, right now, um, when I last checked, we're at about $80,000 $80, or so on COVID expenses related to overtime part-time and, um, and various supplies, uh, anywhere ranging from cleaning 
um, enhanced cleaning of our facilities to just uh, protective uh, PPE equipment, PPEs uh, for the first responders. And that's kind of where we are. And so we're tracking those. Again, as Kevin mentioned, we're looking for anywhere between 75 to 100% reimbursement once they start that process of reimbursing. But we are tracking those separately um, for now. And that's that's really a nutshell of what I have, unless there are any questions on the financials that I shared with you uh, for February. Yeah, Linda, just one question. In, in looking at the revenues, if you, if you break it into two sections, one is the uh, tax collections, which which is right on track, right? And then there's the right. other the other categories of, of various things, which look like they're down a couple million dollars. Is that kind of a, a reasonable assessment? Yes, but I think the big one there, you'll notice that our conveyance, conveyance is down. And even this year, even before the COVID, we, we budgeted for it to be down. Mm -hmm. And then our um, building permits is one that's going to be down. I think we had 900,000. Uh, Brian doesn't think we'll hit that. We didn't hit 900,000 last year either. And therefore, we're, we're bringing that one down as well. Uh, fortunately, as we're making up for it, in other revenues, the tax collections, um, on the investment earnings, and then as we mentioned, that back tax collection number, we've actually exceeded budget from, from what we adopt, uh, adopted. So you expect so that? So all in all, we're going to make up. We'll be fine. We'll, we'll meet the revenue targets uh, as a result of enhanced revenues in some areas, making up for loss of revenues in others. Okay, so we'll make up for that 2.3 million that shows up there. Thank you. Joanne, you're on mute. There you go. Okay. Uh, this past Monday, the Board of Education approved both January and February's financial statements or statement of accounts as we call them. Uh, the January report includes all of the reforecast that we did uh, in order to prepare our 2021 budget. And so those transfers are reflected uh, in that column called current. Approximately a half a percent of our budget was reallocated uh, between objects. The, uh, just in a nutshell, the primary account that was transferred into was our tuition out of district account or our outplacement account. And it's, uh, we're gonna be approximately a half a million over in that account this year. Uh, and we had funds in other accounts throughout the budget in smaller increments uh, to make up that shortfall. Uh, we continue to monitor that. Uh, given the fact that we are homeschooling right now or uh, long distance uh, learning, we don't expect some last minute uh, placements to take place as we've had in previous years. But again, we're gonna continue to monitor that. Um, overall, our budget is on track for spending in almost all of our accounts. Uh, we were fortunate to have some savings in our salary accounts with additional turnover and so forth. Uh, so this forecast actually goes through the end of December and certainly does not reflect you know, the changes that have taken place in the last uh, few weeks. As we've said before, we do anticipate having additional funds go back to the town. The exact number will depend on what happens moving forward. But we certainly are respectful of the request that has come from the town finance board asking us not to spend money on anything that's not required. And so we are gonna do that. As far as the COVID uh, response and our reimbursement, we too are putting funds into a separate account so that we can account for them for reimbursement from FEMA. And they're very similar to the towns. It's cleaning, it's supplies, um, it's some staffing that we've had to uh, work overtime for those, those issues. Uh, but overall, we're a little bit south of 50,000 right now. And, but we'll continue to monitor that. And there's no transfers on the February report. It's just a continuation of operations. And we'll have more um, sense at the end of March with the March report as to where we're gonna come in year end. Great. Great. Thanks. Hey, Brian, um, just um, two, one, you know, one, one question, one observation. The question really is, you know, what's your gut sense as to how distant learning is going for the kids or for the teachers. And then, uh, you know, what I'm hearing sort of on the business side is um, that um, 
lots of people thinking that this virus is a game changer in terms of the way they do business. And uh, even I wouldn't want to mention the name of the company, but one of the biggest companies in the country uh, was having a discussion with their CEO and um, while they were using, you know, sort of working at home and distant, distant working, they were using it often. They're basically saying to themselves, boy, this is working really well. Technology is terrific and we can reduce our, our real estate footprint and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, one extreme on the business side, um, a little hard in my mind to see that that would work quite as well in the classroom. But I was just, you know, but I'm not a teacher. I was just sort of wondering from your perspective, um, how's it working? But also, is this um, something, you know, over the next five or 10 years might, 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 might evolve? You know, I think um, it's interesting. Well, first, how's it working? So I, we're actually, it's working very well. Uh, our teachers, fortunately, uh, thanks to the you know, connections that we have with uh, different community organizations here, we saw this coming about three weeks in advance or more. Um, we started hearing from other people about what was happening in different parts of the world. And we started preparing well before we actually went out and closed. So, I mean, Dr. Keating's here to her credit. She made sure that the business ops can all continue, including payroll and others, all remotely, you know, and that happened across all of our different sectors. So, cause there's the distance learning part, but there's also the distance operational sort of making it all happen. So um, all of the different functions really jumped right on board and we got this all figured out. As far as the learning goes with kids, um, you know, we're learning, we're growing. We're already, we're in phase two already. Uh, phase three is probably coming down the pike. Um, we've changed our schedule. We've done some things to, uh, to try to strike that balance. Um, we've got three big goals with it. You know, it's not a purely academic goal. That is one of them, certainly, to continue learning and progressing academically, intellectually, you know, help uh, spur kids' curiosity and to do that. But it's also relationship-driven. And that's where yeah. – um, and then there's also the, the um, focus on giving kids a purpose every day. Right. So giving them a schedule, giving them a reason to get up, get dressed, get ready, do their work, giving them some deadlines. And, you know, adolescents will um, we know what happens without a schedule and structure and purpose. So we've those three things are sort of our big goals with it. Um, those relationships are so key because that's where the health and wellness and safety comes from for kids. And kids really only learn from people they trust you know, people that they have relationships with. Um, so that's really been something we've been working on. I think that the, as far as sort of transformational outcomes, I think we'll see some changes more in the higher ed than we'll see it in K-12. You know, because the, again, K, the adolescents, teenagers and down, they're really emotionally driven in their learning and uh, they need to have those connections with their teachers in order to trust them enough to take those leaps that we want them to leap to truly learn and grow. Um, so I, we might see some changes, and I think it really speaks to the adaptability and commitment of our staff that, I mean, they're working harder than they've ever worked before. So maybe for some, it's different for our teachers, you know, between communicating with the kids, the parents, the sort of keeping up with all of what's going on. Um, they're doing it, and they, we had, that's what, what part of why we moved to phase two. They tried to do it first as a classroom replacement experience where it literally was delivering the lessons and doing it on the same pace. And now we've said, wait a minute, we've got to make this much more sustainable. And so we've gone to a block schedule at the high school and done things like that. Um, we're learning a lot. I think what the difference will be our successful infusion of technology into our the learning experience going forward. It may certainly not be remote. You know, what we're trying to do, and I, I don't want to go on too long, but we're, what we always push teachers to do is learn how to do asynchronous lessons for kids so that anytime they're out of the building, they could log in and learn and do it when they're ready to do it. The whole model's flipped. Now we're working on teachers to help them figure out how to provide synchronous learning for kids virtually like this so that they get everyone on the screen and they're connecting with them and they're, you know, helping them to, to learn by providing instruction. Uh, college level students, older adult learners, we're much more motivated in different ways. We don't necessarily need that connection interpersonally in the same way uh, because we're doing it for other reasons and other motivations. Kids in, in our schools need those interpersonal connections. So that's where, you know, it's where we're, we're facing a lot of a host of challenges every day. But uh, I'll tell you, I think that our teachers have really responded so well as, as everybody, I mean, across the organization, people are working every day to, 
support what we're doing and support the families. So I'm proud of it. I think it's um, it's you know, a hard statement when to say when you, when you, but if you could exclude the restaurants and you know those those places that are just absolutely closed down because they can't be open. I mean, I think the other part of the economy, uh, which sort of big business and 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 um, the Amazons and the WalMarts of the world, and I mean. I think at the end of the day, you know, they're going to come through this and it's going to be a little bit of a wow, you know, I mean, we didn't realize that, you know, it wasn't as bad as we thought because of technology, but, you know, but it's going to be terrible because of all that part of the economy, like the uh, stores and different things, the, the, the little the small businesses that, you know, really can't really rely on technology. You know, I, I agree, I sort of agree with everything you said. The one thing I was sort of wondering about is the trust with the teacher and the young people, I, you know, I sort of think they trust technology and they trust the other person to the side of technology a little bit too much today. So it's interesting whether, whether in fact, but I mean, I, I've, I've got it, it's, you know, you know, quite interesting. So anyway, you got lots of people doing great things. Um, uh, does there any, anybody have anything under AOB, any other business? I think we covered the agenda. Thanks. It was very efficient. Appreciate it. I'm very happy we weren't what, Zoom banged or whatever they call it. Um, you know, yeah. Zoom bomb. Um, I had curious what it was based on what I heard about the one the other night. Um, hey, Bill. Uh, has Ed Kangas been on? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, Ed, I wanted to mention to you and Bill that I, I was down in Naples back a month ago and I met a fellow Bechtel from, uh, he's now in Charlotte. Who? What's his first name? Um, he was a former. I hear the, the name you said. Bechtel. I forget his first name. Bechtel, uh, the company. No, no, not the company. His last name is Bechtel, like the company, but he was a consultant at Deloitte. I'm sorry. Bechtel. Bechtel. I didn't. I did not know him. Okay. How you say his name, Kevin? Bechtel, same as uh, same as the company. Bechtel, B E C H. T E L. Yeah, I don't think I knew him. I, you know, he was on the, he was on the consultant side. Yeah, he probably knew Ed. Yeah, he knew Ed. He he to, he, I kind of remember. I I'll think of it. I kind of remember the name. I'll think it up. I'll I'll look him up and send you an email. Okay. Hey, hey, hey Bill. Hey Bill. I got I got one comment for the end of the meeting, <clears throat> and I'm dealing with unfortunately on two companies I'm involved with. The ultimate thing an audit committee has to worry about is going concern. Uh, I think we in the short run at the, at the town don't have that issue. But I, who knows where this virus is going? I won't get into it. You know, I'm on <clears throat> board of Tenant Healthcare, the big hospital company. We got all kinds of models, et cetera. And there are some that are kind of scary. I guess my comment would be as I think the town at this point in time ought to be very cautious about You've got a number of capital projects in front of you, police department, libraries, whatever. I think right now it'd be wise to just put those things on hold for 60 or 90 days. I would hate for us to get committed and find this thing becomes a problem. We hear you, Ed. Okay. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> You're Bill, on mute. You're on... Bill, you're on mute. He's, he's signing off. Oh, okay. Uh... Thank, thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks, everyone. Home. Thanks. Goodbye, Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Bye, Joe. Everybody. I got off mute. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Bill. Bye. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. Um, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Hey, Tom, Thank I you. found a hand with the thumb, Tom. Yay! <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good job, George. Thank you, guys. Nice to see you all. Make sure you give Linda a kiss for helping you with all that oh, technology. Okay. <laughs> I'll, do I'll do that right away. <laughs> hey, hey, Chuck, when do you anticipate the next meeting? Uh, I think our next scheduled meeting is June 9th. All right, we'll stick with that then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to shut her down. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.